Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. Trump prosecutor Fannie Willis faces multiple ethics complaints in Georgia. Fulton County's Ethics Board has set a date to discuss the embattled DA. Former President Trump asking for a one-month delay in enforcing the $355 million civil fraud ruling against him. What his lawyers are saying. Democrats ramp up attacks against independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. How his campaign is responding. A bipartisan House delegation visits Taiwan as the Pentagon approves new arms sales to the island. Lawmakers vowing firm U.S. support. Germany today voting against delivering powerful cruise missiles to Ukraine. Why the Chancellor is reluctant to send them. The centerpiece of St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City undergoes restoration for the first time since the mid-18th century. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Thousands of AT&T customers have reported cell service outages. More than 74,000 customers reported issues with placing calls, texting, or accessing the internet, according to tracking site Downtector. Some Verizon and T-Mobile customers have also reported service disruptions, but both companies say their, networking, their networks aren't experiencing an outage. It's likely their customers have had issues trying to connect to those on the AT&T network. AT&T says it's working to restore service. An industry source says there's no indication the outage was caused by a cyber attack or other malicious activity. They say it appears to be related to how cellular services hand off calls from one network to the next. And former President Trump is asking New York Supreme Court Judge Arthur N. Grant to delay enforcing the $355 million civil fraud ruling against him for one month. In a letter to the judge yesterday, Trump's attorneys accused the New York Attorney General Letitia James of pushing to enforce the judgment. She submitted a proposal for the judge to sign just days after the ruling. Trump has 30 days from when a judgment is entered to post bond and appeal. He was ordered to pay $355 million plus interest for fraudulently inflating the values of his properties. He was also banned from acting as an officer of any New York business for three years. In a separate letter on Wednesday, Trump's lawyers argued the former president was denied the chance to speak against the ruling before the judge filed it. They want enough time to submit a proposed counterjudgment. In Georgia, the Fulton County Board of Ethics confirmed yesterday it will take up multiple complaints against District Attorney Fonnie Willis. It set a special meeting on possible ethics violations in the second week of March. Members of the public are welcome to attend. Two specific complaints are listed in the board's letter. Greg Mantle with the Investigative News Service on Substack filed several complaints last month. He wants to see Willis's expense reports for 2021 to 2023. He also asked to see special counsel Nathan Wade's contracts during that time and other related records. His complaints stem from a motion filed by Trump's co-defendant Michael Roman to disqualify Willis in the Georgia election case. The Trump prosecutor is accused of financially benefiting from a relationship with Wade. Both testified last week, denying allegations of any impropriety. The board's letter lists another individual named Stephen Kramer for the other complaint. The Republican National Committee is securing a rare donation from the Teamsters. The organized labor group usually donates to Democrats. The Teamsters describe themselves as the largest and most diverse labor union in America. The organization was founded over a hundred years ago. The union's political action committee donated $45,000 to the RNC convention fund late, late January. That's according to data from the Federal Election Commission. The donation came just days after Teamsters President Sean O'Brien met with former President Trump. The contribution isn't an endorsement, but it is a significant show of support. The union hasn't officially endorsed any candidate for this year's election yet. In 2020, they endorsed President Biden. The union has continued to donate, donate heavily to Democratic causes in recent months. And the former president's daughter-in-law, Lara Trump, says the RNC needs to raise half a billion dollars for the 2024 election. She didn't rule out using the funds to pay her father-in-law's mounting legal fees. Donald Trump has endorsed her to be the new co-chair of the committee. 
Laura Trump said she didn't know whether it, if that would be allowed under RNC rules, but she sees the payment as being in line with the interests of Republican voters. A spokesperson for the former president later told ABC News that no RNC funds will be used to cover legal fees. A Quinnipiac University poll released yesterday shows President Biden narrowly leading Trump in a November rematch, but voters are concerned about Biden's age. 49% of voters polled favor Biden in the upcoming election, while 47% support Trump. 67% of voters say Biden is too old for a second term in office, while 57% say Trump is not too old to serve again. 34% believe Biden is mentally fit, compared to 48% who believe Trump is mentally fit. The poll surveyed over 1,400 registered voters nationwide last week. And President Biden's brother, James Biden, testified before lawmakers yesterday. The eight-hour-long closed-door interview was part of the GOP-led panel impeachment inquiry into the president. That's over whether he was involved in the family's foreign business dealings or alleged influence peddling. James Biden reportedly testified in his opening statement there was never any involvement or any financial interest in his business ventures from his older brother and that during his 50-year career he always relied on his own talent, skills and personal relationships and never his status as, his, as Joe Biden's brother. Now, Republican investigators say some of his deposition contradicts that and that he made efforts to avoid directly answering questions. And TD's Jeremy Sandberg has more on the testimony and the response. James Biden, in a statement Wednesday, said there is no basis for this inquiry to continue and that his appearance would give committees the information to dispel negative assumptions about his relationship with his brother. House Republicans allege President Biden and his family improperly profited from policy decisions Biden had a part in as VP during the Obama administration and are looking for any involvement in the family's foreign business dealings. The younger Biden testified his brother has no involvement in his business, none. The closed-door interview comes just days after DOJ Special Counsel David Weiss charged former FBI informant Alexander Smirnov of fabricating a multi-million dollar bribery scheme about the president, his son Hunter Biden, and a Ukrainian energy company. Prosecutors say Smirnov admitted to contacts with officials associated with Russian intelligence and are fighting to put him back behind bars while he awaits trial. He hasn't entered a plea yet. Congressman Jamie Raskin, the top Democrat on the House Oversight Committee, says the indictment is reason to shut the probe down. He called the investigation a wild goose chase and says it's time to fold up the circus tent. It appears like the whole thing is not only obviously false and fraud fraudulent, but a product of Russian disinformation and propaganda. Representative William Timmons says he finds it convenient prosecutors are only charging Smirnov now for statements he made in 2020. They've indicted the confidential source that they trusted for years and made, uh, paid him hundreds of thousands of dollars. House Judiciary Chair Jim Jordan says the FBI saw Smirnov as a valued source for years, and his indictment doesn't change the underlying facts of the panel's investigation. Hunter Biden makes a call. Devin Archer told us he made a call to his dad, to Joe Biden. And then three days later, uh, Joe Biden goes to Ukraine and conditions the release of American tax money on the firing of the prosecutor applying the pressure to the company that Hunter Biden set on the board of. Those facts, they don't change what, regardless of what this, uh, this confidential human source has said. First son Hunter Biden is set to testify next Wednesday before the GOP-led House panel. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. And Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s run for the White House at getting the attention of Washington Democrats. In a recent campaign, the Democratic National Committee attempted to tie the independent candidate to a MAGA donor who also gave money to Trump. On the campaign trail, independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is making a pitch to black voters disillusioned by the Democratic establishment. There's a lot of black voters in this country who've been voting who are taken uh, for granted by the Democratic Party. But outside Kennedy events, billboards linking the candidate to MAGA Republicans, paid for by the Democratic National Committee. President Biden's allies at the DNC have recently ramped up efforts to undercut Kennedy's candidacy. Earlier this month, the committee filed a complaint with the FEC accusing Kennedy's campaign and a super PAC supporting him of illegal coordination. Kennedy says this shows he's shaking things up in Washington. I think both Republicans and Democrats, the infrastructure and the leadership are of course going to be worried. Earlier in January, it was reported that a mega donor backing Republican frontrunner Donald Trump also donated to Kennedy's campaign. 
Timothy Mellon, heir to the Mellon banking fortune, reportedly gave $10 million to American Values 2024, the super PAC fund in Kennedy. Kennedy drew flack recently at the Super Bowl, when the same PAC showed a $7 million campaign ad that repurposed elements from his uncle John F. Kennedy's 1960 presidential campaign. In response, American Values published a statement on their website Wednesday. They refuted claims by the DNC that the ad was bought and paid for by Trump's largest donor, Tim Mellon, and said the ad's idea, funding, and execution came primarily from Nicole Shanahan, a Democratic donor who contributed to Biden's 2020 campaign. The ad also garnered criticism from some members of RFK Jr.'s family. One member of my family whose feelings were hurt by that ad, and I apologized. I, I said I, that I was sorry that he felt that way. But I have no apologies about the ad. I think the ad was a good ad. While early polling shows significant levels of interest in Kennedy as an alternative to a 2020 rematch, it's difficult to know exactly how much of a threat Kennedy poses to Biden. And in a unanimous vote, the Florida Senate passed a bill that would authorize the disclosure of documents concerning convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. The records in question were part of a 2006 Florida grand jury inquiry into the now deceased financier. The new legislation broadens the criteria for the release of evidence or testimony from a grand jury. The Florida House of Representatives also unanimously passed the bill last week. Governor Ron DeSantis wrote on X that he'll sign the bill into law. He says all files related to Jeffrey Epstein's criminal activities should be made public and criticized the federal government for continuing to, in his words, stonewall accountability. Up ahead, why are housing prices soaring in one New York county? The House Financial Services Committee says government overreach could be at play. A hearing aimed at getting to the bottom of unaffordable housing for local residents. And this year's CPAC kicking off today with conservative leaders, activists, and public officials gathering at the nation's capital. Jack Bradley standing by in DC with a live report for us after the break. Two Republican candidates left in a high stakes race you don't want to miss. Watch it with us in the action and at the Data Hub on the Nation Decides 2024, the South Carolina primary with Steve Lance and Tiffany Meyer. Live on February 24th at 6 p.m. Eastern on NTD News. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now. just young people, hungry, homeless, and vulnerable. Abused youth often feel safer on the street. Now, more than ever, that's the most dangerous place of all. Covenant House is helping young adults facing homelessness. We're providing safe shelter to thousands, but the need is overwhelming, and no young person is ever turned away. Please call or go online now with your gift of $19 a month to help a young person. You'll provide safe shelter, hot meals, and medical care. Your gift will show them they're loved. Homeless young people are afraid and alone with nowhere else to turn. You want to know that there's somewhere you can go that's safe. So the Covenant House did that for us. Please call now with your gift of $19 a month. We'll send you this blanket as a reminder of the comfort your gift provides a young person tonight. Please don't wait. Your gift is the lifeline a young person needs now. 
Call the number on your screen or go online to safeplacetosleep.org. Thank you for saving precious lives. A friend of mine, she told me about Bonatti. He was the only one to address all four deaths as quickly as possible. And if you're to that point where you can't take it anymore like I was, do your research, find out who the best is, and get it done. Visit askbonatti.com. Looking for a healthy and smooth tasting brew? Drop by Day's Coffee Roasters today and explore our wide selection of specialty grade small batch roasted coffee. Home to North America's first enzyme fermented coffee, we source a wide selection of specialty grade coffee beans from around the world and our baristas are ready to craft your customized brew. Visit Day's Coffee at 28 North Street, Middletown, New York. Come experience a brew like no other. Join us on NTD Good Morning because we want you to stay informed. Kickstart your morning with the latest you missed overnight. Right, and don't forget that inspiration. Absolutely, so let's shine some light on the good news too. Tune in every weekday morning to NTD News. New York's district attorney is at odds with Arizona right now. Police there arrested 26-year-old Rod Almansuri. He's accused of stabbing two women in the state. But New York police want him for killing a woman in a Manhattan hotel earlier this month. The Maricopa County Attorney's Office is refusing to extradite him. I know they did a hard job and they did a good job, but we will not be agreeing to extradition. I've instructed my extradition attorneys not to agree to that. We're going to keep him here. These are mandatory prison sentences. And having observed uh, the treatment of violent criminals in the New York area by the Manhattan DA there, Alvin Bragg, I think it's safer to keep him here and keep him in custody so that he cannot be out doing this to individuals either in our state or county or anywhere in the United States. Bragg's office didn't take kindly to the implication that he's soft on crime. A spokeswoman for his office said New York's murder rate is half of that in Phoenix. She called Maricopa County's refusal to extradite a political game. New York police believe it's possible the suspect may have also committed crimes in other states. In Wisconsin, the search for missing three-year-old Elijah Vu continues. The boy was last seen by his adult caregiver in Two Rivers on Tuesday. He was last seen wearing gray pants, a dark colored shirt, and red and green dinosaur slipper, slipper, slip on shoes. Law enforcement, volunteers, and community members are searching tirelessly. Police say spreading false rumors and information can hinder the search and ask neighbors to check their property for any signs of him. The Two Rivers Police Department is asking the public to provide assistance. Anyone with information can call 920-686-7200. And now we begin our coverage of a House Financial Services Committee hearing about the high cost of housing in New York State's Rockland County. The committee will look at how taxation, regulatory mandates, and disincentives for growth put in place by the state and New York City have contributed to this trend. They say Rockland County is a good case study for this. Let's watch. Uh, today's hearing about uh, restoring prosperity in American communities by examining the failures of status quo housing policy. This is an important topic that we have correctly devoted a lot of attention to in this Congress and, frankly, in previous Congresses. Thus far, over the last 12 months, the subcommittee has held six hearings exploring various aspects of how everyday Americans are having their lives impacted by bad government decisions and failed federal policies on housing. Uh, the result is reduced prosperity, reduced customer choice, and reduced optimism that things are going to get better anytime soon. Uh, people aren't believing that it's really transitory. Making matters worse, as we will hear from testimony today, is the alarming notion that the local input in the process doesn't even matter or isn't necessary. In fact, sometimes it's treated as a barrier. 
Uh, instead of working collaboratively with local mayors, supervisors, and other county officials to balance the needs of residents uh, in their own communities, all too often bureaucrats, whether in state governments like Albany or in Washington, D.C., want to impose mandates on places like Orangetown, Nyack, New York City, Cincinnati, Middletown, Lincoln, uh, Nebraska. Ironically, it's uh, the local citizens who are forced to implement uh, their overreaching and, expan and excessively expensive policies and add insult into injury, they're the ones that end up footing the bill. So by the way, these same bureaucrats say that anyone who opposes these ideas isn't just wrong, they're mean-spirited and selfish people. Uh, but simply put, bureaucrats pushing these ideas uh, don't really care about what local residents think. Uh, they have an agenda and they're seeking to push it uh, and it's almost like no matter what, they're inclined to not listen. So today, hopefully, we'll give voice to local communities and uh, a, a more wide-ranging uh, set of views. So in Congress, every member is dealing with some aspect of affordable housing. Members of our committee are particularly focused on legislation that provides solution. I especially want to thank my colleagues Mike Flood from Nebraska and Mike Lawler, uh, who many of you know locally. Um, They've been some of the most committed uh, members on housing policy, uh, host, hosting roundtables in their districts, and uh, advancing legislation to try to address uh, the issues. So for our seventh hearing, we decided to travel to New York uh, to our colleague Mike Lawler's district so that we could see firsthand the impacts that poorly designed, heavy-handed federal, state, and local housing mandates uh, are having. Uh, folks in Rockland County find themselves in a situation that's become all too common in areas around the country. Housing's already been too expensive and now inventory is limited. Lawmakers' response to force mandates sounds good on paper, but ends up uh, hurting affordability and availability for residents most in need. Uh, these impacts are real. I look forward to addressing them uh, with our witnesses today. And so today I would like to Welcome the testimony of uh, Mr. Ralph Amacucci. Mr. Amacucci of uh, Amer Amacucci Associates PC is more is here on behalf of the Institute of Real Estate Management, uh, the New York chapter. Uh, the Honorable Teresa Kenny, uh, she's the supervisor uh, of the town of Orangetown, New York. Uh, Mr. John Ketchum, Mr. Ketchum is a fellow and director of cities at the Manhattan Institute. And Ms. Leah Goodridge, uh, she is the managing attorney for housing policy uh, at Mobilization for Justice. So we thank you for taking the time to be here today. Now, without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. Uh, Mr. Amacucci, you are now recognized for five minutes to give your oral remarks. Chairman Davidson and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here to testify at this important hearing. My name is Ralph Amacucci. I am the managing partner of Amacucci Associates PC, attorneys at law, concentrating in real estate. Our firm concentrates its real estate practice in areas of landlord-tenant matters, buy and sell transactions, bank representation, commercial leasing, and representation in front of the New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal. I am an active member of the Institute of Real Estate Management, IRAM, where I am a certified instructor. I hold the certified property manager, CPM designation, and I serve as Vice President of Education for the New York Chapter. I am also an adjunct assistant professor of real estate accounting at New York University's Shack Real Estate Institute and in the Civil Engineering Department at NYU's Tandem School of Engineering, as well as an adjunct professor in the Accounting Department of Manhattan College in the Bronx, New York. Today, in more and more communities, hardworking Americans are unable to rent or buy homes due to increased housing costs. These rising costs are driven by a lack of supply created by barriers to development and burdensome laws currently in existence that increasingly make it extremely challenging to build housing at almost any price point, particularly at affordable to low and middle class families. The total share of cost burdened households, thus paying more than 30% of their income to housing, increased steadily from 28% in 1985 to 3 point, uh, to 36.9% uh, uh, in 2021. While other households have been priced out of the communities altogether, 
in their search for affordable housing. This is not sustainable, particularly in a period of high inflation. It's crucial that we start now to enact policies that will incentivize new housing production. As Congress examines approaches to address housing affordability, I implore the committee not to use failed state-level housing policies as a prototype. Many states, including New York, have enacted policies that have an adverse effect on the creation of affordable housing units and current conditions of existing housing. I would like to specifically address the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act, the HSTPA, which was passed in New York in 2019 that negatively affects renters and discourages affordable housing development. The HSTPA removed virtually all incentives for owners to uh, re renovate rent-stabilized apartments vacated by long-term tenants. This resulted in more than 30,000 units remaining vacant. The HSTPA capped the amount of individual apartment improvements at $15,000 over 30 years, which translated to about $83 a month of additional rent, when the true cost to rehab a unit is approximately $100 to $150,000. The HSTPA also removed vacancy decontrol, which allowed owners to raise rents to market when the tenant vacated the apartment. No municipality has vacancy control. In the 2019 law essentially states that if a renter leaves an apartment, no matter what happens, the rent stays the same. Even California, with the perception of being very punitive against property rights, an owner can reset the rent when, the, when, the, when it becomes vacant. Thousands of conservatives are gathering just outside D.C. for this year's Conservative Political Action Conference. The event is streaming live on our website at ntd.com. NTD's Jack Bradley is there. Jack, give us the latest from CPAC. Hey guys, yeah, I'm over here just outside of D.C. where thousands of conservatives are gathering to hear from conservative leaders about values that matter most to them. Uh, issues like the 2024 election, um, immigration is a big one, and energy. Uh, so, But the headline speaker is speaking on Saturday. That'll be Donald Trump. And that's the same day as the South Carolina primary, uh, where he leads Nikki Haley by several points, a wide, wide margin. And uh, she was actually speaking at last year's CPAC, but this year she's not. Uh, we can see a mostly pro-Trump crowd here. Uh, other speakers include potential running mates for Trump, including J.D. Vance, Elise Stefanik, Vivek Ramaswamy, Christy Nome, others. Uh, so we have to see what they're going to say. Another issue to pay attention for here is um, how to address foreign policy and if we should keep funding the war in Ukraine or take another route. Uh, we'll be here till Saturday and uh, we'll bring you the latest from the ground here. Guys, back to you. Great. Thanks so much, Jack. Great report there. And for more CPAC content, content, be sure to visit our website at ntd.com where we're live streaming the event, as we said earlier. Coming up, a bipartisan House delegation visits Taiwan as the Pentagon approves new arms sales to the island. Lawmakers vowing firm U.S. support. And United Airlines is set to become the first American carrier to resume flights to Israel since the start of the war in Gaza. That and more when we return. The highest art is beautiful, breathtaking, timeless, and moving. Experience art with 5,000 years of history, inspired by the divine. These are all farmers. Maybe no, not this not one. A farm anymore. But here is a farm, right? No, it is also not a farm anymore. All these people shut down because of the government policies? Yeah. The government wants to control the food. So we don't eat meat, but we eat insects. As the price of staples goes through the roof, people will say, I can't afford a steak anymore. So, all right, I'll, just, I'll eat your stupid crickets. One 
single person is sometimes all it takes to change the course of history. With courage and great effort, our ancestors built the pillars we stand on today, leaving us a legacy of art, music, and wisdom. At the heart of almost every culture is our relation and connection with the divine. Today, their profound contemplations, beliefs, and great sacrifices have at times become misunderstood and even ridiculed. With the help of academic experts, we'll shine a new light on some of the most influential and courageous characters in history. And the miracles that surround them. When I drink it, the first thing was it, I feel the warmth in my, in my tummy. It's kind of like gently radiating out, you know, a kind of a very comforting warm. And it was really good, actually. I felt uh, uh, much better. I did feel, actually, an effect. And I find that it is actually better when I take it regularly. It's actually steamed and dried nine times. And so it's really, the essence is really extracted. Then the second time I tried it really like on an empty stomach and just, just two, two teaspoons of it and over a few times. And wow, that was a big difference because suddenly I could feel, why wow, I was very good energized. I didn't have to eat. I could work outside in the garden for a couple of hours and I still felt very well. And I was impressed by that. So I think it's a good product. I'm Arian Pastar in South America, Brazil, and we are NTD News. Welcome back. The IRS is zeroing in on corporate jet usage as it cracks down on wealthy tax cheats. The agency said today it'll start dozens of audits this spring. The IRS commissioner says there are currently 10,000 corporate jets operating in the U.S. Tax benefits for business air travel can add up to tens of millions of dollars in deductions. The IRS is concerned some business people are taking the deductions for flights that are, in reality, personal trips. There may also be individuals failing to report personal use of corporate jets as income. Joining us now is NTD business host Don Ma to give us the latest updates from the tech world. What do you have for us today, Don? Okay, so for today's conversation, it seems like it's going to be uh, AI themed. Uh, so I've noticed something interesting with Google's AI chatbot. Uh, so Google has recently wrote, rolled out an AI chatbot not too different from that of ChatGPT. It's called Gemini, and this is an AI tool that is able to generate uh, different images when prompted to do so. Uh, along with other uh, capabilities. So I was playing around with it last night, and then it seems to me that uh, Google's chatbot here uh, has a racial bias potentially against white people. Uh, now hear me out on this. Uh, it's not just me, many other people online have found a similar pattern. So Gem Gemini will uh, frequently produce images of black, Native American, and Asian people when prompted but seems like uh, to refuse uh, when asked for uh, to generate images of white people. Fascinating. <laughs> can, you, can you give us an example of what you mean? So yeah, as an example, I asked the chatbot yesterday to generate a picture of a black person, and then as you would expect, it did so, uh, generating uh, multiple images uh, of what I asked. And then I asked Gemini the same question, this time uh, of a picture of a white person. And guess what? It refused to do that. Uh, the response it gave me was that, quote, unfortunately, I could not generate the images you requested. Uh, and of course, I tried this many times and I got the same result. Uh, in fact, one time I asked it to generate a picture of a white person. It gave me a picture of a black person instead. Uh, so th that's a big contrast in my opinion. And again, like I said, it's not just me. Uh, other people online have found this uh, pattern as well. And some have asked it to uh, show pictures of America's founding fathers and also got images of black people. And another example from Fox News Digital is that it asked it to show images um, 
that celebrate the diversity and the achievements of white people. And the chatbot also refused on that, uh, according to Fox News, saying that uh, historically media representation has overwhelmingly favored white individuals and their achievements. Uh, so apparently that's the reason why it didn't give uh, an image. So several conservative online users uh, have criticized the search engine, uh, saying that uh, this, this was evidence of how woke uh, apparently the AI model was. What's Google saying about this, Don? Right, so in response to the back backlash, Google uh, issued a, a sort of apology, uh, recognizing the unintended consequences of its AI's actions, saying that it was aware that a Gemini is offering inaccuracies in some historical images, uh, generating uh, uh, depictions of some figures, uh, and that the, the company is actively working to fix this immediately, and it's also saying that Gemini uh, is AI in image generation is supposed to generate a wide range of people, um, but it seems like uh, it has also acknowledged that definitely it has missed the mark here. All right, Don Ma, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, cheers. Thanks so much. Dynabook Americas has recalled more than 15 million Toshiba laptop AC adapters due to burn and fire hazards. The recall includes AC adapters sold with Toshiba brand personal laptop computers, as well as sold separately. They have date codes between April 2008 through December 2012. People should immediately stop using the recalled AC adapters and reach out to Dynabook Americas for a free replacement. Consumers need to submit a photo of their AC adapter with the power cord cut and certify proper disposal to get a free replacement. A $75 million arms sale to Taiwan. The State Department is giving the plan the go-ahead Wednesday, one day before a congressional delegation touched down in Taipei. Congressman Mike Gallagher is leading the group and brings one more important message about this. Let's take a closer look. A bipartisan show of support for Taiwan. A congressional delegation is visiting Taiwan Thursday, and Representative Mike Gallagher Chairman of the House Select China Committee is leading the charge. He said the U.S. needs to fix one big problem, delivering the weapons that Taiwan has bought. We need to ensure that we're delivering on the foreign military sales that you've purchased, that we've approved, but have yet to be delivered. We have a $20 billion backlog. Beijing sees Taiwan as part of its territory and has pledged to take it under control by force if necessary. That's despite never having controlled the island. The U.S. doesn't have formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but is bound by law to sell arms to Taiwan so it can defend itself. Gallagher noted the U.S. stands with Taiwan. The United States, Democrats and Republicans, stands with Taiwan for your freedom and for ours. For as Taiwan goes, so goes the world. Taiwan must remain, as it stands today, a candle, burning freely, freely, fiercely, and improbably against the darkness. The U.S. lawmakers met with Taiwan's outgoing president, Tsai Ing-wen. Your visit further highlights the close partnership between Taiwan and the United States. And President-elect William Lai. We are facing a rapidly changing global geopolitical landscape, and also tremendous pressure on diplomatic, military and economic coercion coming from China. Lai said he hopes to continue to stand with the U.S. and the free world once in office. The American delegation will stay in Taiwan for three days. The trip is part of a larger visit to the Indo-Pacific region. And United Airlines will soon resume flights between the U.S. and Israel. The airline had suspended flights between the two countries following the October 7th Hamas terror attack and the ensuing war in Gaza. In a statement today, it says it plans on resuming a daily flight from New York and Newark beginning 2nd March. The initial flights will include a stop in Munich, Germany. The airline says it hopes to resume daily nonstop service beginning March 6th. United says it made the decision following a, quote, detailed safety analysis while also consulting security experts and government officials. 
United says it will continue to monitor the situation in Tel Aviv and adjust the schedule as warranted. It also says resumption of flights from San Francisco, Washington, D.C., and Chicago will be evaluated in the fall. And shifting gears now, we have some short headlines from Germany, Italy, and other European countries. Poland's Prime Minister Donald Tusk today confirmed that the Polish and Ukrainian governments will meet in Warsaw on March 28th. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky asked for the meeting yesterday. Zelensky wants to discuss protests by Polish farmers as the demonstrations are blocking the border between Poland and Ukraine. The farmers are speaking out about what they call unfair competition ever since the EU waived customs tax on Ukrainian imports in 2022 because of the war. Although Poland's prime minister agreed to the meeting, he didn't accept a request to talk about the border blockades. This as Tusk is trying to balance support for Ukraine while addressing farmers' concerns. Italy today announced plans to sign a security agreement with Ukraine. That's to help Kyiv strengthen its defense industry and fight hybrid threats such as cyber warfare. Italy's move comes after Germany, France and Britain announced similar pacts to help Ukraine. The deal reiterates Italy's com commitments to humanitarian assistance and protection of critical infrastructure. The country will also pledge support for Ukraine's efforts to adopt reforms required to join the European Union. German lawmakers today voted against delivering certain cruise missiles to the Ukraine. Weapons in question are the powerful Taurus missiles. The chancellor is reluctant to send them to Ukraine due to fears of a wider escalation of the war, but the opposition is pressuring him to reconsider. I'm asking all of you to join our demand on the government to finally send the Taurus missiles to Ukraine. Farmers from the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Poland staged protests along Czech border crossings on Thursday. Demonstrators are demanding less bureaucracy plus changes to European Union policies. Organizers said farmers from 10 EU countries were participating. Farmers across Europe have been stepping up demonstrations this year, including in France, Germany, Spain and Italy. One of their main sticking points is constraints from the European Green Deal, a climate change initiative. Farmers say that the policies limit their business and make their products more expensive than non-EU imports. They also say grain and other agriculture products come from Ukraine, coming from Ukraine and Latin America negatively affect the market. Some waved national flags and held signs saying stop Ukrainian grain. Some tourists in Paris say they're disappointed as the top of the Eiffel Tower is no longer on their itineraries. The iconic tower is closed for its fourth consecutive day today due to striking staff. One visitor says she had bought her ticket months ago. We bought tickets about four months ago to go to the top today. I've been before, but the children haven't been before. And yeah, it's, I guess it's, it's one thing that you do when you come to Paris. She come to France to experience the, you know, all these landmarks and coming here, not knowing about the strike, it kind of, it puts a downer on the holiday. The tower's workers have been on strike since Monday. Union members say Paris City Hall is underestimating the cost of scheduled work ahead of the Olympic Games. They say this would result in lax maintenance, which might negatively affect visitors. Unions have not indicated when they will end the strike. The Eiffel Tower is one of the most visited monuments in the world. It welcomes around 6 million people every year. Coming up, the centerpiece of the St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City is under restoration for the first time since the mid-18th century. And a more than 300-year-old tapestry factory in Madrid is still thriving. Generations of weavers produce colorful pieces using centuries-old equipment and techniques. More shortly here on NTD News Today. The tempting online world is encroaching on our campus. Is unplugging cables and confiscating phones the solution to protect our children? No, we just need a clean multimedia platform. Join Ganjing Campus to leverage premium channel features, professional development courses, and kindness event toolkits tailored for teachers. Build a truly positive and interactive classroom community. Foster a pure and delightful learning environment for children. There is a road laid out for me. 
boxes everywhere. And this is gonna be Addie's room. I am blind. You're really gonna like it. I hope so. Yeah. I know this road is there for me. There is a love First night here, but Amy seems cool. I got this. Okay. If I'm really free, take me down to the river and wash me. was the process of actually putting this all together. Many, many hours of finding the right camera angles and watching it. The first trouble started just after one o'clock. 45 pages, here it is right here. Donald Trump has been indicted. Somber day for the country. This all happened before President Trump's speech was over. The founder of the Oath Keepers Militia Group is headed to prison for more than 18 years. His lawyers didn't have this no. video. The, the video we're watching right now his own lawyers did not no. have. There was a big question of what did the people do who actually did enter the building. This is where we picked it up with the security footage that is new. At this point, the, the story dramatically changes. The New Jersey man who assaulted a Capitol police officer on January 6th has been sentenced. So this was withheld. This was not shown to the defense. That could be considered exculpatory evidence. This doesn't seem like what a lot of the media is showing. You. It's going to change narratives no matter what your political perspective is. What we're after is the truth. I'm going to bring you the most accurate and insightful information on NTD Newsroom. Join me weekdays right here on NTD News. A religious icon is under re renovation for the first time since the mid-18th century. Crafted by Gian Lorenzo Bernini, the Baldaquin in the center of St. Peter's Basilica. The nearly 100-foot-high bronze and wood canopy covers the high altar of the basilica and was built on the spot where the first Pope St. Peter is believed to have been buried. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. The $800,000 restoration project for Bernini's Baldaquin is underway. Father Enzo Fortunato describes the canopy's significance to St. Peter's Basilica. Its symbolic and religious importance is represented by its being in the center of the basilica. And because there on that altar takes place the Eucharist, for what Christians is the culminating source of life. Alberto Capitanucci is an engineer at the Fabrica di San Pietro, the department in charge of St. Peter's. He says the structure needed special attention after 250 years of use and abuse. The goal is to return Bernini's Baldekin to its glory before the inauguration of the 2025 Holy Year. In reality, the most complex part will be the wooden part of which the entire Baldekin ceiling is made. The Holy Spirit that we see from the altar ceiling is a highlight compared to a wooden sky. The Baldekin is really a processional canopy. So the sail is inflated at the top thanks to a vessel-like shape. The Holy Year starts on Christmas Eve 2024, when the Pope opens the Holy Door of the Basilica. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A more than 300-year-old tapestry factory in Madrid is still operating today. Generations of weavers have produced colorful carpets and tapestries using centuries-old equipment and techniques. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the threads. Weavers sit side by side at a giant loom in Madrid's Royal Tapestry Factory. They produce luxury rugs and coats of arms manually. King Philip V founded the factory in 1721. We manufacture carpets of Turkish knot and Spanish knot, of course tapestries, which is the origin of this factory. 
heraldic banners, which are these coats of arms that hang from balconies, palaces, and public institutions. We restore all types of fabrics. Marta Soria is a master tapestry weaver. She has been working at the factory since she was 18 years old. She explains the manufacturing process. We use our handle, which is graphite, or our cane, which we stain with Indian ink. Thread by thread, stitch by stitch, we go through, turning each thread 360 degrees. Otherwise, we would lose the pattern when we knit. Once we have done this, we have a range of colors, which we prepare beforehand. The factory's director says their aim is to be at the technological forefront. The facility also works to support a sustainable and environmentally friendly industrial model. To preserve trades that are thousands of years old, but above all, are sustainable and form a fully circular economy. Here the only products we work with are silk, wool, jute, cotton and linen. And these small leftovers that we create, the water from the dyes, or the small pieces of wool, everything is recycled. The factory's archive contains more than 10,000 tapestry sketches and designs. It even contains letters autographed by famed painter and printmaker Francisco de Goya. Goya worked at the factory from 1775 to 1780. First of all, we have preserved all the documentary heritage of the factory. That is to say, we have preserved all the memories from 1721, when the factory was founded, to the present day. And secondly, apart from this historical and artistic value, there are documents that continue to function for the production of new pieces. The factory holds guided tours every week to showcase its work. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. NASA is looking on to take on applicants for part of a simulated one-year mission to Mars. Those selected will help the agency plan for human exploration of the Red Planet. The second of three planned ground-based missions is scheduled to begin in spring of 2025. Each mission includes volunteer crew members living and working inside a 1,700-square-foot habitat at NASA's Houston Space Center. Crew tasks will include simulated spacewalks, robotic operations, habitat maintenance, exercise, and crop growth. Wow, so fascinating. NASA is looking for healthy, motivated U.S. citizens for permanent residents who are non-smokers, 30 to 55 years old, and proficient in English. The deadline for applicants is April 2nd. NASA said pay details will be discussed during the screening process. And in Southern California, three rescued burrowing owls are being reintroduced into the wild after rehabilitation. Researchers found the owls last year in, at two separate nests. One parent disappeared from the two nests. Researchers say burrowing owls are not able to fledge young if they don't have both parents present. The owls were brought to San Diego Humane Society's Project Wildlife. They stayed for a few months, receiving treatment for malnourishment, dehydration and parasites. The owls were then brought to the San Diego Zoo's Safari Park, where they were head-started. We decided that it would be in the best interest of the, the chicks at each of those burrows to, um, to come into, into human care and then get head started where they would, would be raised until they're adults and then they could be released and, um, and contribute to the longer term conservation of their species. And in Los Angeles, firefighters were able to successfully rescue a horse from a sinkhole on Wednesday. Footage showed the firefighters working with a team of animal rescue specialists to fit a harness around the horse and then lifting it out of the hole. The Los Angeles Fire Department said the horse weighed around 1,200 pounds. It was conscious and alert. After being rescued, the horse was washed and fed. The fire department said they couldn't determine the cause of the sinkhole and how the horse became trapped to begin with. And in a video of a cunning fox is trending on social media. In it, you can see the fox stealing a phone belonging to an animal rescue officer. This happened in England earlier this month. The rescuer was called to the scene to assist an injured fox and set up his phone to record the action. But another fox had a different idea. It watched the phone being set up, grabbed it and ran off with it, and then dropped it in nearby bushes. The Royal Society for the Pre Prevention of Cruelty to Animals said the injured animal was rescued and received the necessary treatment. Well, that is some good news. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, please feel free to email us at news.today at ntd.com. Thank you for watching NTD News Today. We will have more of CPAC and NTD Newsroom at 2 p.m. Eastern.
there are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. Yeah, so there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We are NTD. Hi, I'm Elijah. When I grow up, I want to be a robotic engineer. Robert does everything he can as a grandfather to provide for Elijah and his five siblings. Not being hungry allows my grandkids to live, to enjoy life. When I'm hungry, it affects me. Like, if I'm trying to read, I'll go to sleep. Or if I'm trying to do something around class, I'll get distracted. Every child has dreams. And every child needs healthy food to make those dreams come true. One in five children face hunger in America, and food costs are rising. Call or go online right now to join Feeding America with your gift of just $19 a month, only 63 cents a day. Together, thanks to a nationwide network of food banks, dedicated volunteers, and the monthly support of people like you, we can fill plates with nutritious food for families across America. It helps us, like, if we need some food, we'll go get food. We're getting closer to the day when no one in America faces hunger, but we can't do it without you. Call now or go online at helpfeedingamerica.org and give $19 a month, just 63 cents a day. 98% of donations go directly to help millions of people facing hunger, from coast to coast and in your own community. When you get my credit card, you'll receive this exclusive Canvas grocery bag to show you're a part of a movement to ensure that everyone has the food and resources they need to thrive. Please call now or make your monthly donation at helpfeedingamerica.org. Working together, we can end hunger in America. Is deep sea fish oil really healthy? Due to pollution in the oceans, most fish contain heavy metal elements and radioactive substances. That's why it's so important to choose a pure source of omega-3. Puritan green vegetable omega-3 is made from purslane and perilla seeds, which are rich in nutrients and minerals, especially vitamins A, D, E, calcium and iron. With natural processing and no harmful chemical additives, it has more than 90% concentration of omegas 3, 6, 7 and 9. It effectively improves brain power and is beneficial to the heart's health. Puritan Omega-3 does not smell of fish and contains no pollutants, so both adults and children can safely and easily consume it over a long period of time. Puritan Green Vegetable Omega-3. Greener, healthier, and more effective. Visit puritan.com to learn more. Hi, I'm Kelly Wright. We thank you for joining us and watching America's Hope here on NTD News. Bottom line is, I know you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, but let's give you some good news in the midst of the bad news. Watch us nightly 
right here on MTD News for a full dose of America's hope. Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. A controversial New York City law that would have allowed non-citizens to vote in local elections struck down. What happens with an appeals court and what they have to say about it? The Michigan primary is coming up fast and voters are taking absentee ballots by storm. Find out how many have already cast their votes and how that compares to 2020. Fallout from last week's landmark Alabama Supreme Court ruling has begun. Hear why Alabama's biggest hospital has put in vitro fertilization procedures on hold. Arizona refuses to extradite the suspect in the killing of a woman at a New York City hotel. Why did prosecutors make this decision? Japan's Nikkei stocks surged to an all-time high. See how investors are reacting and what's driving the momentum. And the Odysseus spacecraft is touching down on the surface of the moon. This will mark the first U.S. moon landing in more than half a century. Why has it taken so long? This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Thousands of AT&T customers have reported cell service outages. More than 74,000 customers reported issues with placing calls, texting, or accessing the internet, according to tracking site Down Detector. Some Verizon and T-Mobile customers have also reported service disruptions, but both companies say their networks aren't experiencing an outage. It's likely their customers have had issues trying to connect to those on the AT&T network. AT&T says it's working to restore service. An industry source says there's no indication the outage was caused by a cyber attack or other malicious activity. They say it appears to be related to how cellular services hand off calls from one network to the next. And a New York appeals court struck down a law yesterday that would have let certain non-citizens vote in local elections, including those for mayor and city council. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on the court's decision. A state appeals court declared the law unconstitutional. The Our City Our Vote law says that anyone with a green card or work authorization who has been in the city for at least 30 days can vote in municipal elections. It was first passed in December 2021 by the Democrat-controlled New York City Council. It would have resulted in around 800,000 newly eligible voters in a city with less than 5 million active registered voters. Progressive Democrats who championed the law argued it would make U.S. politics more inclusive by allowing immigrants without citizenship to vote. Opponents of the bill, mainly New York Republicans, argued it would undermine the integrity of elections and dilute the power of U.S. citizens' votes. Republican Congressman Nick Langworthy and a handful of other plaintiffs challenged the law in court in 2022. Months later, it was struck down. Judge Ralph Porzio of the New York State Supreme Court for Staten Island ruled that the law violated the state constitution, which states that every citizen is entitled to vote. New York City Mayor Eric Adams' administration defended the law and appealed the lower court ruling. Wednesday's appeals court decision has dealt a blow to those efforts. It's unclear whether Mayor Adams' office intends to file an appeal. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Michigan primaries are not until next Tuesday, but residents are out at the polls for early in-person voting. Over 18,000 people cast in-person ballots during the first possible weekend of voting. And nearly 750,000 people have already sent in their absentee ballots. Over 1.3 million people asked for absentee ballots this year, which is 60% more than in 2020. This is the first time all voters in Michigan have had at least nine days to vote early in person due to a law passed in 2022. While well, the state will hold both Republican and Democratic primaries on February 27th, that's open to all voters. The Michigan GOP will also hold a March 2nd caucus convention for party loyalists. That's according to nonprofit news site Bridge Michigan. 
The party will split its presidential delegates based on the results of the primary and the caucus convention. And joining us now is Benjamin Weingarten, political analyst and editor-at-large at Real Clear Investigations. He's also an Epic Times contributor. Benjamin, welcome. Great to have you with us. Um, to begin with, you know, various states hold both a primary and a caucus. We, we saw it with New Hampshire, and, and it didn't really change the outcome there, and it wouldn't have anyway because of the rules they had. But why, why the split methods? Could you explain that to us and what impact it could have in Michigan? Well, yes, Michigan does have this hybrid process on the Republican side, as you noted, split between a primary open to all voters and then a more party centric caucus system. And the majority of all delegates who will represent Michigan at the Republican National Convention, the lion's share will come from the party caucuses and this convention that's going to occur in early March. Why is that the case? Well, the party itself wants to have, be able to exert greater control over who is represented at the RNC. And frankly, that's how it's been more traditionally. The party controls ultimately the delegate process and ultimately the party is responsible for selecting the candidates. And it's sort of akin to the electoral college itself where we select electors. We don't actually vote for the candidates themselves. So this is generally done as a means for a party to exert more control in a primary process. In this case, on the Republican side, the primary is all but over. So the party isn't necessarily really going to have disproportionate sway ultimately over the fact that Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee from the state. But if you had something more like a 2016 process where you had nearly two dozen candidates, certainly then the party control over the process would be disproportionate. Okay, now I want to look specifically at what's happening in Michigan, its significance. Former President Trump is saying, if we win Michigan, we win the election. So what is Michigan's place in this race? Well, Michigan is a very interesting state in that it's one of the Rust Belt battlegrounds, which was pivotal, uh, as I alluded to, in 2016, pivotal as well in 2020. We're talking about razor-thin margins between Republican versus Democrat presidential candidates in this state. In 2016, it was pivotal for Donald Trump winning the general election against Hillary Clinton. And it's really got interesting sort of makeup to it. You have the kind of populist sentiments, nationalist sentiments in the way of traditional American manufacturing. There's certainly probably uh, some sentiment which is against globalism and the exporting of jobs and manufacturing particularly to communist China. And then on the Democrat side, you have not only big cities like Detroit, which are essential for Democrats potentially winning the election, but also college towns, as well as, as clearly the Biden administration is emphasizing Muslim American voters broadly and Palestinian Arab immigrants in particular, uh, who disproportionately make up the population in Dearborn, Michigan. Why are you know, tens of thousands of votes there potentially really significant. Well, again, the state's been decided by razor thin margins of tens of thousands of votes. And Arab Americans broadly have expressed grave discontent with the Biden administration's policy towards the Israel Hamas war. And so consequently, the Biden administration has been sending out a whole slew of envoys to the Dearborn area to try to allay the uh, fears and criticisms of the Arab American and Muslim American community more broadly that's located there because the Biden administration is afraid that voters are gonna sit on their hands or vote for someone other than Joe Biden. That could cost him Michigan and consequently cost him the general election as well. So for that reason on both sides, Michigan is a pivotal state in the 2024 presidential election. Right, and it's not like Biden can give up his other voters who support US support for Israel. So he's, he's in a bit of a tough spot right there. But how do you think this strategy is working in Michigan for him? Well, at this point, the continued discontent that we're hearing from uh, purported Muslim and Arab American leaders there indicates that they are dissatisfied with the administration and that for some, nothing the administration does is going to allay their concerns. And of course, this is ironic because uh, on the conservative side, and certainly in my personal opinion, as I've expressed, 
the Biden administration has been incredibly hostile towards Israel in the Israel-Hamas war. And right now, it has filtered out this view that maybe the U.S. will unilaterally recognize a Palestinian state, which would in effect be a terror state and potentially have Hamas as part of the ruling unity government there. It's trying to force a ceasefire and a hostage for jihadist exchange that will ultimately extend into the end to a war and in effect a win for Hamas. So as you rightly noted, this puts the Biden administration in a bind. On the one hand, it's not radical enough. It's not pro Hamas enough in effect for Palestinian Arab voters and Muslim Americans in places like Dearborn and likely in progressive college communities and cities across the country. But on the other hand, the vast majority of Americans stand with Israel, and that includes large percentages within the Democrat Party. So this is a a threading of a needle that I don't think ultimately is going to be possible for the administration. And the question is, are these voters who are discontented with his policy truly going to sit on their hands or right. vote for another candidate like a Cornell West, or will they ultimately come around? And that's a major question that the Biden campaign is dealing with right now. Absolutely, big questions, and we'll definitely be keeping our eye on all of this as it develops. Thank you so much, Benjamin Weingarten, political analyst and Epic Times contributor. Really appreciate it. With the South Carolina Republican primary coming up this weekend, NTD News will be covering all the action. We'll have a lot prepared for you, including special guests on the ground coverage and the Data Hub. Join Steve Lance and Tiffany Meyer on The Nation Decides 2024 live this Saturday, February 24th at 6 p.m. I'll also be there too. In Georgia, the Fulton County Board of Ethics confirmed yesterday it will take up multiple complaints against District Attorney Fonnie Willis. It set a special meeting on possible ethics violations in the second week of March. Members of the public are welcome to attend. Two specific complaints are listed in the board's letter. Greg Mantle with the investigative news service on Substack filed several complaints last month. He wants to see Willis's expense reports from 2021 to 2023. He also asked to see special counsel Nathan Wade's contracts during that same time and other related records. His complaints stem from a motion filed by Trump co-defendant Michael Roman to disqualify Willis in the Georgia election case. The Trump prosecutor is accused of financially benefiting from a relationship with Wade. Both testified last week, denying allegations of any impropriety. The board's letter lists another individual named Stephen Kramer for the other complaint. The Republican National Committee securing a rare donation from the Teamsters. The organized labor group usually donates to Democrats. The Teamsters describe themselves as the largest and most diverse labor union in America. The organization was founded over 100 years ago. The union's political action committee donated $45,000 to the RNC's convention fund late January. That's according to data from the Federal Election Commission. The donation came just days after Teamsters President Sean O'Brien met with former President Trump. The contribution isn't an endorsement, but it is a significant show of support. The union hasn't officially endorsed any candidate for this year's election yet. In 2020, they endorsed President Biden. The union has continued to donate heavily to Democratic causes in recent months. And the former president's daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, says the RNC needs to raise half a billion dollars for the 2024 election. She didn't rule out using the funds to pay her father-in-law's mounting legal fees. Donald Trump has endorsed her to be the new co-chair of the committee. Laura Trump said she didn't know whether if that would be allowed under RNC rules, but she sees the payment as being in line with the interests of Republican voters. A spokesperson for the former president later told ABC News that no RNC funds will be used to cover legal fees. And Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s run for the White House is getting the attention of Washington Democrats. In a recent campaign, the Democratic National Committee attempted to tie the independent candidate to a MAGA donor who also gave money to Trump. On the campaign trail, independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is making a pitch to black voters disillusioned by the Democratic establishment. There's a lot of black voters in this country who've been voting, who are taken uh, for granted by the Democratic Party. But outside Kennedy events, billboards linking the candidate to MAGA Republicans, paid for by the Democratic National Committee. President Biden's allies at the DNC have recently ramped up efforts to undercut Kennedy's candidacy. 
Earlier this month, the committee filed a complaint with the FEC accusing Kennedy's campaign and a super PAC supporting him of illegal coordination. Kennedy says this shows he's shaking things up in Washington. I think both Republicans and Democrats, the infrastructure and the leadership are, of course, going to be worried. Earlier in January, it was reported that a mega donor backing Republican frontrunner Donald Trump also donated to Kennedy's campaign. Timothy Mellon, heir to the Mellon banking fortune, reportedly gave $10 million to American Values 2024, the super PAC funding Kennedy. Kennedy drew flack recently at the Super Bowl when the same PAC showed a $7 million campaign ad that repurposed elements from his uncle John F. Kennedy's 1960 presidential campaign. In response, American Values published a statement on their website Wednesday. They refuted claims by the DNC that the ad was bought and paid for by Trump's largest donor, Tim Mellon, and said the ad's idea, funding, and execution came primarily from Nicole Shanahan, a Democratic donor who contributed to Biden's 2020 campaign. The ad also garnered criticism from some members of RFK Jr.'s family. One member of my family whose feelings were hurt by that ad, and I apologized. I, I said that I was sorry that he felt that way. But I have no apologies about the ad. I think the ad was a good ad. While early polling shows significant levels of interest in Kennedy as an alternative to a 2020 rematch, it's difficult to know exactly how much of a threat Kennedy poses to Biden. Coming up, Arizona refuses to extradite the suspect in the killing of a woman at a New York City hotel. Why did prosecutors make this decision? And attorneys making opening statements today at the first trial related to the fatal shooting of a cinematographer by Alec Baldwin on the set of Rust. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. Hospitals for Children has helped more than 1.3 million kids just like me, regardless of their family's ability to pay. Shriners Hospitals for Children is only able to provide this world-class, life-changing medical care because of the generous gifts of people just like you. Because of you, I can ride my bike. I can play basketball. Because of people like you, I can run. I can smile. Will you send your love to the rescue today? When you go to loveshriners.org right now and give just 63 cents a day, you're helping kids just like me. Like me. Like me. When you give today, we'll send you this adorable love to the rescue blanket as a thank you and a reminder of the love you gave to a kid just like me. Your gift, no matter how small, can help a child today. This is your moment to make a difference. When you pick up your phone, you know you have it right there. And call to give. You're helping kids like me. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Please call or go online now. If operators are busy, please call again or give right away at loveshriners.org. Your gift makes a difference. Thank you for giving. Life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome. 
pre-diabetes does. With early diagnosis, pre-diabetes can be reversed. Take the one-minute pre-diabetes risk test today. Go to doihaveprediabetes.org. If you love them enough to crawl into a play place to get them to come down, then surely you'll check nhtsa.gov slash the right seat to make sure they're in the right car seat. I'm Iris Tao at the White House, and we are NTD. The defendants in former President Trump's civil fraud case are asking the judge to delay the enforcement of penalties. This includes Trump's $355 million fine and the temporary ban on operating a business in New York. We turn now to our legal correspondent, Arlene Richards, for more details. Arlene, what are some of the reasons the defendants are giving for this? Well, just to be clear, former President Trump's attorney is not the one who filed this motion. The attorney for his two sons filed it, but former President Trump will benefit from this or could benefit from this. And what they're saying is that Attorney General Letitia James is rushing the enforcement of the order or of the fines. Uh, they say that she filed a proposed order on Tuesday and that the judge has not given them an opportunity to file a counter order. Okay, so has the judge responded to the request? Well, he has, and he granted the request, but the response to that was that, well, uh, there is a couple of things that, uh, procedural steps that the uh, attorney general has skipped, and which are usually done in this kind of a situation. And they say that if the judge decides to sign her order, uh, that they want a 30-day stay on the actual enforcement of the fines. I thought the defendants already had 30 days to pay the fines. How would granting this request change any of that? Well, that's right. Normally, from the date that the judge signs the order, the defendants would have 30 days to actually pay the fine or post a bond if they're planning to appeal. But they're asking for the judge to wait 30 days before actually signing the order, which actually would essentially give them about 60 days to pay. So the, the uh, attorney for Trump, Alina Haba, has been saying that he has lots of cash and that he can pay the fine. On the other hand, uh, Letitia James has been saying if he can't come up with the cash, then she's going to ask the judge to seize his assets. So it's not really clear whether or not they're having some difficulty coming up with the cash or whether this is some sort of a strategy to get more time to prepare the appeal. Mm, lots to watch out for here. Thank you so much, Arlene. Always Thank great you. to have you on. And we're already seeing consequences from the Alabama Supreme Court's ruling that found frozen embryos are children. The University of Alabama at Birmingham Health Systems is pausing in vitro fertilization treatment while it evaluates the court's decision. It's the first organization in the state to confirm it's putting such treatments on hold after the landmark ruling. Administrators are, are worried patients and doctors could be criminally prosecuted or face punitive damages based on the decision released last Friday. The ruling doesn't prohibit IBF, IVF, but opens up medical providers to wrongful death claims related to the embryos involved. Critics say the ruling could also make fertility treatment unaffordable for many families and force parents to pay lifelong storage fees for embryos they can't legally discard. New York's district attorney is at odds with Arizona right now. Police there arrested 26-year-old Rod Almansuri. He's accused of stabbing two women in the state. But New York police want him for killing a woman in a Manhattan hotel earlier this month. The Maricopa County Attorney's Office is refusing to extradite him. I know they did a hard job and they did a good job, but we will not be agreeing to extradition. I've instructed my extradition attorneys not to agree to that. We're going to keep him here. These are mandatory prison sentences. And having observed uh, the treatment of violent criminals in the New York area by the Manhattan DA there, Alvin Bragg, I think it's safer to keep him here and keep him in custody so that he cannot be out doing this to individuals either in our state or county or anywhere in the United States. Bragg's office didn't take kindly to the implication that he's soft on crime. A spokeswoman for his office said New York's murder rate is half of that in Phoenix. She called Maricopa County's refusal to extradite a political game. New York police believe it's possible that the suspect may have also committed crimes in other states. 
And illegal immigration in California is on the rise, according to federal government data. More immigrants are choosing not to enter the U.S. through Texas. This is shifting immigration west. San Diego is experiencing an increase in illegal border crossings. The chief of the U.S. Border Patrol said the San Diego sector has made over 140,000 apprehensions since this fiscal year began in October. And over 20,000 of them were from China. That's a 500% increase compared to the same, time, same period last year. The head of the Border Patrol Union recently warned about an increase in military-aged Chinese men crossing the southern border illegally. He says some of, the me some of them may be spies working on behalf of China's communist regime to infiltrate the U.S. Besides Chinese nationals, the San Diego sector saw thousands of Afghans, Russians, Africans, and others enter since October. And in Wisconsin, the search for missing three-year-old Elijah Vu continues. The boy was last seen by his adult caregiver in the Two Rivers on Tuesday. He was last seen wearing gray pants, a dark colored shirt, and red and green dinosaur slip-on shoes. Law enforcement, volunteers, and community members are searching tirelessly. Police say spreading false rumors and information can hinder the search and asks neighbors to check their property for any signs of him. The Two Rivers Police Department is asking the public to provide assistance. Anyone with information can call 920-686-7200. And two years after cinematographer Helena Hutchins was fatally shot on the set of Rust, the film's weapons handler is on trial today. The case may have implications for actor Alec Baldwin, who was also charged after a prop gun went off, killing Hutchins. Armorer Hannah Gutierrez-Reed has pleaded not guilty to involuntary manslaughter. The prosecution, prosecution says as chief weapons expert on set, she was responsible for loading Baldwin's prop gun with a live bullet. She also faces charges of tampering with evidence, to which she also pled not guilty. If convicted, she faces up to three years in prison. The jury was sworn in yesterday. Opening statements are expected today. The IRS is zeroing in on corporate jet usage as it cracks down on wealthy tax cheats. The agency said today it'll start dozens of audits this spring. The IRS commissioner says there are currently 10,000 corporate jets operating in the U.S. Tax benefits for business air travel can add up to tens of millions of dollars in deductions. The IRS is concerned some business people are taking the deductions for flights that are, in reality, personal trips. There may also be individuals failing to report personal use of corporate jets as income. Dyna Book Americas has recalled more than 15 million Toshiba laptop AC adapters due to burn and fire hazards. The recall includes AC adapters sold with Toshiba brand personal laptop computers as well as sold separately. They have date codes between April 2008 through December 2012. People should immediately stop using the recalled AC adapters and reach out to Dynabook Americas for a free replacement. Consumers need to submit a photo of their AC adapter with the power cord cut and certify proper disposal to get a free replacement. Up ahead, a bipartisan House delegation visits Taiwan as the Pentagon approves new arms sales to the island. Lawmakers vowing U.S. support. Five people are dead after a cargo ship crashed into a bridge in China. Footage reveals the aftermath. And Germany today voting against delivering powerful cruise missiles to Ukraine. Find out why the Chancellor is reluctant to send them in just a moment here on NTD News Today. Two Republican candidates left in a high stakes race you don't want to miss. Watch it with us in the action and at the Data Hub on The Nation Decides 2024, the South Carolina primary with Steve Lance and Tiffany Meyer. Live on February 24th at 6 p.m. Eastern on NTD News. What was the process of actually putting this all together? Many, many hours of finding the right camera angles and watching it. The first trouble started just after one o'clock. 45 pages, here it is right here. Donald Trump has been indicted. Somber day for the country. This all happened before President Trump's speech was over. The founder of the Oath Keepers Militia Group is headed to prison for more than 18 years. 
his lawyers didn't have this no. video. The, the video we're watching right now, his own lawyers did not no. have. There was a big question of what did the people do who actually did enter the building. This is where we picked it up with the security footage that is new. At this point, the, the story dramatically changes. The New Jersey man who assaulted a Capitol police officer on January 6th has been sentenced. So this was withheld. This was not shown to the defense. That could be considered exculpatory evidence. This doesn't seem like what a lot of the media is showing. It's going to change narratives no matter what your political perspective is. What we're after is the truth. I'm Richard Karn, and I love my hose. It ain't those old hoses. This is my hose. The new Pocket Hose Copper Bullet, now infused with real copper, so your water is always clean and lead-free. Just turn on the water and watch your hose grow and grow. And when you turn off the water, away it goes. Our new inner tube uses three layers of high-strength latex on the inside. Then it's wrapped in a new polymer filament jacket, three times stronger than the other hoses. And I love the oversized, easy-to-grip fittings. Get the super light 25-foot pocket hose copper bullet today for only $29.99. But wait, call now and get our TurboShot adjustable nozzle absolutely free. This is an exclusive advanced release of our 2024 edition pocket hose. Order now. Call 1-800-617-2364 or visit copperbullethose.com. So call 1-800-617-2364 now. These are all farmers. Maybe no, not this not one. A farm anymore. But here is a farm, right? No, there's also not a farm anymore. All these people shut down because of the government policies? Yeah. The government wants to control the food. So we don't eat meat, but we eat insect. As the price of staples goes through the roof, people will say, I can't afford a steak anymore. So, all right, I'll, just, I'll eat your stupid crickets. We're in the nation's capital asking the important questions so that you're in the know. Join us daily, Monday through Friday, on the Capitol Report on NTD News. An unprecedented expose of Beijing's global spying activities. Leaked documents from a Chinese state-linked spying agency show China's cyber intrusions against foreign governments and infrastructure. Hackers claim they have the ability to attack Microsoft, Apple and Google users. According to the Washington Post, the leaked cache was posted to GitHub last week. They contain more than 570 files, images and chat logs. The documents belong to iSoon, a Shanghai-based private security contractor with ties to China's top policing agency and military groups. The files detail contracts spanning eight years. At least 20 foreign governments are on the target list, including the UK, India, South Korea, Thailand, and Malaysia. Chinese dissidents are also being tracked, including those in Hong Kong or the heavily, heavily Muslim region of Xinjiang. The documents reveal in detail the methods and tools used by Chinese authorities to hack other countries and promote pro-Beijing rhetoric on social media, often on X, formerly known as Twitter, or through email. Other tools include devices disguised as power outlets and batteries that can be used to hack into Wi-Fi networks. And a $75 million arms sale to Taiwan, the State Department giving the planned the go-ahead Wednesday after one day before a congressional delegation touched down in Taipei. Congressman Mike Gallagher is leading the group and brings one important message. Here's a closer look. A bipartisan show of support for Taiwan. A congressional delegation is visiting Taiwan Thursday, and Representative Mike Gallagher, chairman of the House Select China Committee, is leading the charge. He said the U.S. needs to fix one big problem delivering the weapons that Taiwan has bought. We need to ensure that we're delivering on the foreign military sales that you've purchased, that we've approved, but have yet to be delivered. We have a $20 billion backlog. Beijing sees Taiwan as part of its territory and has pledged to take it under control 
by force if necessary. That's despite never having controlled the island. The U.S. doesn't have formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but is bound by law to sell arms to Taiwan so it can defend itself. Gallagher noted the U.S. stands with Taiwan. The United States, Democrats and Republicans, stands with Taiwan for your freedom and for ours. For as Taiwan goes, so goes the world. Taiwan must remain, as it stands today, a candle burning freely, freely, fiercely, and improbably against the darkness. The U.S. lawmakers met with Taiwan's outgoing president, Tsai Ing-wen. Your visit further highlights the close partnership between Taiwan and the United States. And president-elect William Lai. We are facing a rapidly changing global geopolitical landscape, and also tremendous pressure on diplomatic, military and economic coercion coming from China. Lai said he hopes to continue to stand with the U.S. and the free world once in office. The American delegation will stay in Taiwan for three days. The trip is part of a larger visit to the Indo-Pacific region. In China, five people were killed when a cargo ship crashed into support pillars of a bridge earlier today. It caused part of the bridge to break off and sent vehicles plunging into the water. It happened on a waterway in southern China's Pearl River Delta, near the city of Guangzhou. All road traffic on the bridge was halted. Two vehicles, including a bus, fell into the water. Three other vehicles ended up on the ship. At least three people were injured. More than 100 emergency workers, including divers, were involved in the rescue. Authorities are still investigating the cause of the accident. They hinted at improper operation by the crew. And good news for Japan, investors are celebrating after the Nikkei stock index hit a record high today. For the first time, it surpassed levels in 1989 during the bubble economy there. I am very happy that the stock market is rising because investors are confident that Japan is overcoming deflation and that corporate performance is improving. I think these are probably very different from the last time. Japan's Nikkei 225 share benchmark surged today to an all-time high, but by early afternoon it rose to over 39,000. The previous record was set in December of 1989. It was just before Japan's bubble economy collapsed in the early 1990s. Japanese shares have logged sharp gains in recent months. There are strong interests from foreign investors. They account for the majority of trading volume on the Tokyo exchange. The weakness of the Japanese yen against the U.S. dollar has also attracted investors. Record gains in corporate earnings have enhanced the appeal of buying shares in Japanese companies. And United Airlines will soon resume flights between the U.S. and Israel. The airline had suspended flights between the two countries following the October 7th Hamas terror attack and the ensuing war in Gaza. In a statement today, it says it plans on resuming a daily flight from New York and Newark beginning March 2nd. The initial flights will include a stop in Munich, Germany. The airline says it hopes to resume daily non-stop service beginning March 6th. United says it made the decision following a, quote, detailed safety analysis while also consulting security experts and government officials. United says it will continue to monitor the situation in Tel Aviv and adjust the schedule as warranted. It also says resumption of flights from San Francisco, Washington, D.C. and Chicago will be evaluated in the fall. And shifting gears now, we have some short headlines from Germany, Italy and other European countries. Poland's Prime Minister Donald Tusk today confirmed that the Polish and Ukrainian governments will meet in Warsaw on March 28th. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky asked for the meeting yesterday. Zelensky wants to discuss protests by Polish farmers as the demonstrators are blocking the border between Poland and Ukraine. The farmers are speaking out about what they call unfair competition. Ever since the EU waived customs tax on Ukrainian imports in 2022 because of the war. Although Poland's prime minister agreed to the meeting, he didn't accept a request to talk about the border blockades. This as Tusk is trying to balance support for Ukraine with addressing farmers' concerns. Italy today announced plans to sign a security agreement with Ukraine. That's to help Kyiv strengthen its defense industry and fight hybrid threats such as cyber warfare. 
Italy's move comes after Germany, France and Britain announced similar pacts to help Ukraine. The deal reiterates Italy's commitments to humanitarian assistance and protection of critical infrastructure. The country will also pledge support for Ukraine's efforts to adopt reforms required to join the European Union. German law lawmakers today voted against delivering certain cruise missiles to Ukraine. The weapons in question are the powerful Taurus missiles. The chancellor was reluctant to send them to Ukraine due to fears of a wider escalation of the war, but the opposition is pressuring him to reconsider. I'm asking all of you to join our demand on the government to finally send the Taurus missiles to Ukraine. Farmers from the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Poland staged protests along the Czech border crossings on Thursday. Demonstrators are demanding less bureaucracy plus changes to European Union policies. Organizers said farmers from 10 EU countries were participating. Farmers across Europe have been stepping up demonstrations this year, including in France, Germany, Spain and Italy. One of their main sticking points is constraints from the European Green Deal, a climate change initiative. Farmers say that the policies limit their business and make their products more expensive than non-EU imports. They also say grain and other agriculture products coming from Ukraine and Latin America negatively affect the market. Some waved national flags and held signs saying stop Ukrainian grain. And some tourists in Paris say they're disappointed as the top of the Eiffel Tower is no longer on their itineraries. The iconic tower is closed for its fourth consecutive day due to striking staff. One visitor says she had bought her ticket months ago. We bought tickets about four months ago to go to the top today. I've been before, but the children haven't been before. And yeah, it's, I guess it's, it's one thing that you do when you come to Paris. She come to France to experience the, you know, all these landmarks and coming here, not knowing about the strike, it kind of, it puts a downer on the holiday. The towers workers have been on strike since Monday. Union members say Paris City Hall is underestimating the cost of scheduled work ahead of the Olympic Games. They say this would result in lax maintenance, which might negatively affect visitors. Unions have not indicated when they will end the strike. The Eiffel Tower is one of the most visited monuments in the world. It welcomes around 6 million people every year. Coming up, the Odysseus spacecraft is touching down on the surface of the moon. This will mark the first U.S. moon landing in more than half a century. Why has it taken so long? And the centerpiece of St. Petersburg Basilica in the Vatican City is under restoration for the first time since the mid-18th century. More shortly here on NTD News Today. Did you know the government can essentially rob you in plain sight? Former Fed Chair Alan Greenspan warned, deficit spending is simply a scheme for the confiscation of wealth. But he added, gold stands in the way of this insidious process. Birch Gold Group has helped thousands of Americans diversify their IRA or 401k into gold. To get a free info kit from Birch Gold, text PREPARE to 989898. Again, text PREPARE to 989898 right now. I had a pretty normal mom life. Everything was pretty good and it was a very happy life. And we just had a new baby. And then all of a sudden within a day or two, she's on life support and fighting for her life. Then I knew something was pretty wrong. A little less than a week after I came home, I couldn't breathe. That's when we decided to go to the hospital. I was given the diagnosis that I had peripartum cardiomyopathy, which is basically a pregnancy-induced heart failure. They told me my only chance was a heart transplant. And the American Heart Association helped make that possible. Their research helped save me. This could not happen without monthly donations from friends like you. Your sustained support helps fund life-saving research that leads to medical breakthroughs, like those that gave Jen a second chance at life. Heart disease is the number one killer in America, and we urgently need your help to save lives. Go to helpheart.org or call now to become a monthly donor today. Your donation of only $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, will make a difference through prevention, early detection, treatments, and cures that help save lives. I am very thankful for the American Heart Association. 
I am grateful for just every day that I get with my children. Please go to helpheart.org or call now with your donation of just $19 a month. Join our community of monthly donors and you'll get this limited edition t-shirt you could wear to show you're helping save lives. One simple act today can save your life or the life of a loved one. So please call or go to helpheart.org now to help save lives. When they learn something new, and you can just see in their faces, it's such an incredible moment. It's those moments that are my favorite. For the day's top headlines and the news you need to know, tune in right here to NTD Evening News. Welcome back. A potential landmark moment in space exploration. This evening, the Odysseus lunar lander could make the first touchdown of a U.S.-made spacecraft on the moon in five decades. Here's why it's taken so long for this to happen again. And liftoff. Just no days after lifting off from Florida, Odysseus is now barreling towards the moon, sending back spectacular pictures of Earth along the way, and is now hours away from the most perilous test yet for the robotic lunar lander a softer, controlled landing on the surface of the moon. Just go for launch. Intuitive Machines is trying to pull off something go, no private go, company go. has done. Indies, and if successful, it will be the first no, time an American-made spacecraft has done it Copy. since the last <laughs> Apollo mission in 1972. We are steely-eyed rocket scientists, but deep down, uh, this is quite an emotional feeling to, uh, to be here at this position. Just last month, a Pennsylvania company, Astrobotic Technology, had its first lunar landing mission end in failure. And last year, the Japanese company iSpace and the government of Russia both crashed landers into the moon. So why is it so tough to repeat a feat that was first accomplished more than half a century ago? That's one small step for man. The biggest reason is also the most frustratingly terrestrial one, money. NASA's budget at the peak of the Apollo program was more than 4% of all U.S. government spending. Today, NASA's budget is one-tenth the size, just 0.4%, even as NASA attempts to return astronauts to the moon under the Artemis program. In an effort to save money, NASA is outsourcing robotic lunar landings to companies like Intuitive Machines for a fraction of what it cost in the 1960s and 70s. Do it for $100 million when in the past it's been billions of dollars. Then there's the purely technical challenge of landing a spacecraft in a specific spot, roughly a quarter of a million miles away. Some people have likened it to, uh, you know, hitting a golf ball in New York and having it go into a particular hole in one in LA. The distance means there's also a time delay, roughly three seconds for signals from mission control rooms on Earth to get to the moon and back. A lot can go wrong in that time. So when the vehicle is actually landing, it pretty much is on its own. There we go. Finally, there's the experience factor, the loss Whoa. of the Apollo oh, era expertise oh, that no amount of new technology and can make up for. Simply because somebody else did it in an earlier age doesn't mean that this generation or this organization can do it. These are people doing it for the first time, and uh, there's, no, there's no substitute for that experience. We all collectively have to be resilient to failures, and we all have to be helping each other lift up and break down these barriers so that we can begin a lunar economy. That's what this is, a beginning of uh, an emerging economy around the moon. If successful, it would also be the first time any spacecraft has successfully landed on the south pole of the moon. The spot is where NASA wants to send the first Artemis astronauts and where they believe there could be ice and water. And NASA is looking for applicants to take part in a simulated one-year mission to Mars. Those selected will help the agency plan for human exploration of the Red Planet. 
The second of three planned ground-based missions is scheduled to begin in spring 2025. Each mission includes volunteer crew members living and working inside a 1,700-square-foot habitat at NASA's Houston Space Center. Crew tasks will include simulated spacewalks, robotic operations, habitat maintenance, exercise, and crop growth. NASA is looking for healthy, motivated U.S. citizens or permanent residents who are non-smokers 30 to 55 years old and proficient in English. The deadline for applicants is April 2nd. NASA said pay details will be discussed during the screening process. And a religious icon is under renovation for the first time since the mid-18th century. The Baldekin in the center of St. Peter's Basilica, crafted by Gian Lorenzo Bernini. The nearly 100-foot-tall bronze and wood canopy covers the high altar of the church. It was built on the spot where the first pope, St. Peter, is believed to have been buried. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. The $800,000 restoration project for Bernini's Baldekin is underway. Father Enzo Fortunato describes the canopy's significance to St. Peter's Basilica. Its symbolic and religious importance is represented by its being in the center of the basilica. And because there on that altar takes place the Eucharist, for what Christians is the culminating source of life. Alberto Capitanucci is an engineer at the Fabrica di San Pietro, the department in charge of St. Peter's. He says the structure needed special attention after 250 years of use and abuse. The goal is to return Bernini's Baldekin to its glory before the inauguration of the 2025 Holy Year. In reality, the most complex part will be the wooden part of which the entire Baldekin ceiling is made. The Holy Spirit that we see from the altar ceiling is a highlight compared to a wooden sky. The Baldekin is really a processional canopy, so the sail is inflated at the top thanks to a vessel-like shape. The Holy Year starts on Christmas Eve 2024, when the Pope opens the holy door of the Basilica. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Animal rescue centers in the UK are urging prospective cat owners to think carefully before buying designer breeds. There's been a surge in popularity for specific felines, but pedigrees often require special care. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. These cats are Savannah's, a purebred cat known for its slim build and spotted coat. It's one of a number of purebred and pedigree cats that are seeing a surge in popularity, thanks in part to influencers showing off their pets on social media. The huge popularity of these cats in social media, TV, advertising has led to people wanting to acquire them, but without looking into or considering the health and the welfare issues that affect these kinds of cats. Animal charities have reported an increase in cat abandonments at rescue centers. The RSPCA Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals says cases have soared by 300 percent. Breeder Jackie Bliss says designer cats can make ideal family pets, but she says prospective owners need to understand what the animals are like. You need to tell them the pitfalls, the fact that savannas can sometimes open the doors themselves. They like to join into every part of your life. When you're chopping up on the work surface, they'll jump up to see what you're doing. They're naughty. They want to be part of your life. They insist on being part of your life. No matter what kind of feline, potential owners are advised to research their temperament and care requirements before buying one. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And staying with pets, new internal Secret Service documents show Biden's President President Biden's dog, Commander, has bitten Secret Service personnel in at least 24 incidents. The incidents took place at the White House and other locations. The total number doesn't include additional incidents previously reported involving executive residence staff and other White House workers. The new documents show agency personnel changed their habits to avoid being injured by the German Shepherd. Ultimately, Commander had to leave the White House and go live with the other family members. And in Southern California, three rescued burrowing air owls are being reintroduced into the wild after rehabilitation. Researchers found the owls last year at two separate nests. One parent disappeared from the two nests. Researchers say burrowing owls are not able to fledge young if they don't have both parents present. The owls were brought to San Diego Humane Society's Project Wildlife. They stayed for a few months, receiving treatment for malnourishment, dehydration, and parasites. The owls were then brought to the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, where they were head-started. 
we decided that it would be in the best interest of the, the chicks at each of those burrows to, um, to come into, into human care and then get head started where they would, would be raised until they're adults and then they could be released and, um, and contribute to the longer term conservation of their species. And in Los Angeles, firefighters were able to successfully rescue a horse from a sinkhole. Footage showed the firefighters working with a team of animal rescue specialists to fit a harness around the horse and then lifting it out of the hole. The Los Angeles Fire Department said the horse weighed around 1,200 pounds. It was conscious and alert. After being rescued, the horse was washed and fed. The fire department said they couldn't determine the cause of the sinkhole and how the horse became trapped in the first place. And a video of a cunning fox is trending on social media. In it, you can see the fox stealing a phone belonging to an animal rescue officer. Watch this. This happened in England earlier this month. The rescuer was called to the scene to assist an injured fox and set up his phone to record the action. But another fox had a different idea. It watched the phone being set up, grabbed it, and ran off with it, as you can see here, and then dropped it into nearby bushes. The Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals said the injured animal was rescued and received the necessary treatment. Glad to hear that. Well, that's all for today's news. Thank you for tuning in. Feel free to reach out to us with news tips or feedback at news.today at ntd.com. And we'll be back with more stories tomorrow.